Almost here. Well, good morning to the West Coast. Good afternoon to everybody else. Going to talk a little bit about the abundance of money in the state and what that has and how that affects the rents and just about everything out there. A lot of times people just kind of think, well, the abundance of money is a good thing, but it's really how that money flows through the system that really starts to uh, create some havoc throughout the rest of the economy and eventually will cause everybody to fall into poverty once the new money turns off. Now, this is ultimately Cantillon's theory, right? And I'm reading this from Cantillon's essay, this right here, Cantillon's essay on economic theory. This is chapter seven, more on the increase and decrease in the quantity of money in the state. Now, this is a really interesting uh, chapter within it, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, I'm just gonna read a section out of here. But it really describes a lot of the reasons why we're seeing things like rent and housing as expensive as it is right now. And it's not just because of the money printer, it's the separation between the rich and the poor, the inequality that is happening here. So now I'm going to read through this and then we're going to start to discuss it a little bit. When there is an increase in the quantity of money, prices will increase depending on how the new money holders decide to spend their money. The price changes will be will also be affected by such things as regulation on trade and the perishability of the products that are traded. In other words, the simple quantity theory of money is naive in proposing that a doubling of the quantity of money will double all prices equally. Changes in the quantity of money will change relative prices and have real effects on the economy, a phenomenon known as the Cantillon effect. Now, Again, this is written hundreds of years ago, right? So back in the day before they had cell phones and cars and airplanes and, you know, the internet and all the rest of the stuff, Cantillon started to describe what he was seeing within the economy. These are economic forces. These are things that just simply cannot change. And when you start looking through some of the... Some of the things that Cantillon was describing, especially when the new money comes in and how it is that people handle that new money, what it is that they do with it, eventually will start driving out the domestic manufacturers as the move into luxury starts bringing in ever increasing amounts of foreign production. This in turn will have a serious consequence to the people themselves, but it's the way there before that final collapse that you start seeing the realities of the situation and really it comes down to rents and leases. Now, again, I'm gonna read through this a little bit and I think that it's probably going to um, really kind of clear up a lot of the issues that we are, well, not clear them up, but make sense of a lot of the issues that we are facing that we sometimes end up blaming on politics. So now let me read through this essay and then we'll kind of discuss it a little bit here. Thank you all for joining the live stream too. We have 90 people already watching with 18 likes. Go hit that like, that thumbs up button. When you, st when you come into the video, the algorithm loves to see it. They'll pick up the video and start spreading it around for more people to join in. Now here how, here is, here's how it goes, right? Moreover, even if the state in question could keep a balance of trade and its greater abundance of money, it is reasonable to suppose that this abundance will plunge many wealthy individuals into luxury. And now that is going to be the case no matter what time of history that you are looking at. I don't care what country you're from. I don't care who, how you grew up, right? If you get an abundance of money, you're going to want to enjoy that new money. And enjoying that new money means that you're probably moving into luxuries, getting nicer cars, getting nicer houses, getting nicer clothes, eating better food, all the stuff, right? Um, so, and that's what he says, we'll plunge many wealthy individuals into luxury. They will buy paintings, precious stones from abroad. They will want silks and rare objects. And they set such an example of luxury in the state that in spite of the advantage of its ordinary trade, its monies will flow abroad annually to pay for these luxuries. So this is what we are now facing. Like, you know, you think about it, back in the day, the United States was a manufacturing powerhouse. We produced the world's greatest stuff. We sent it out to them. They sent us their money. Well, then that flipped, right? We started enjoying that new money that was coming in. We raised our standard of living and then we started to import a lot of foreign production. And that's exactly what he was describing hundreds of years ago. Like, like there's like, it's not, it's almost crystal clear, right? 
the money will flow abroad annually to pay for these luxuries. This will gradually impoverish the state and cause it to pass from great power to great weakness. Now, this is exactly what was taking place back during the 70s when they had to remove us from the gold standard. Otherwise, we were going to be sending all our gold out to the rest of the world and we would have fallen from that great power into great weakness. That's when they flipped the switch and decided that, no, we're not giving out that gold. We're going to start issuing debt from now on. All right. But back to the back to the essay. When a state has arrived at its highest point of wealth, and I always assume that that the comparative wealth of the state consists mainly in the respective quantities of money, it will inevitably fall back into poverty by the ordinary course of things. All right. We prevented that from happening back in the 70s when we switched to a complete fiat currency. But according to Cantillon's essay, or according to Cantillon, it will inevitably happen once the fiat currency runs out. Let me read this again. Um, when, I, when a state has arrived at its highest point of wealth, and I always assume that the compar comparative wealth of the state consists mainly in their respective quantities of money, it will inevitably fall back into poverty by the ordinary course of things. The too great of abundance of money, which gives power to the state so long as it lasts, throw them back impersonably, gee whiz, I'm horrible at pronouncing words, but naturally into poverty. This, uh, thus, it would seem that when a state expands by trade and the abundance of money raises the price of land and labor, the prince or the legislator ought to withdraw money from circulation keep it for emergencies, and try to slow down its circulation by every means. Does that sound like what they do? Because they don't do it that way, right? Let me read it again. The too great of abundance of money, which gives, gives power to the state so long as it lasts, throws them back uh, imperceptibly. Am I saying that right? Imperceptibly? <laughs> by, by naturally... Or, but naturally into poverty. Thus, it would seem that when the state expands by trade and the abundance of money raises the price of land and labor, the prince or legislator ought to withdraw money from circulation, keep it for emergency, and try to slow down its circulation by every means. Accept compulsion and bad faith to prevent the goods from becoming too expensive and to avoid the drawbacks of luxury. Nobody does that. Everybody moves into luxuries. Everybody wants a bigger house, better cars, nicer food, all the services. They want all the stuff. They want the luxuries. However, it is not easy to perceive the opportune time for this, to withdraw this money, or to know when money has become more abundant than it ought to be for the goods and the preservation of the advantages of the state. Therefore, princes and heads of republic do not concern themselves much with this sort of knowledge and strive only to make use of the abundance of their state revenues, to extend their powers, and to insult other countries on the most frivolous pretext. All things considered, working to perpetuate the glory of their reigns and administration and leaving monuments of their power and wealth is perhaps the best that they can do according to the natural course of humanity. The state must collapse on its own. They will only accelerate its fall a little. Nevertheless, it seems that they should try to make their power last during the time of their own administration. Now, isn't that just perfectly describing politics? I mean, does it not? Like, I mean, think about it. They should, they should not, I mean, what is it? Um... It is not easy to perceive the opportune time to pull the money out of the system, to keep people from diving into luxuries, right? And this would be to the preserving the advantages of the state. Therefore, these heads of public do not concern themselves with this sort of knowledge. Huh, not a doubt in my mind. I mean, we know this from the congressional hearing coming from when they were interviewing Jerome Powell and they were saying like, we didn't understand why you were keeping interest rates so low for so long for such an extended period of time to keep the inflation rates that were up above the 2% target. This was very unusual. Why were you doing this? Right? I mean, they don't concern themselves with the understanding. Like I have, a, I would wonder how many people within our political realm even know what the Cantillon essay is or the Cantillon effect is, right? 
All right, I move on here. Um, okay, all things considered, working to perpetuate their glory and their reigns, okay, and administration, leaving monuments of their power. Uh, we got that. Okay, few, here we go. This is, this is where it gets really good. Like, I'm just kind of babbling here, but this is where it gets pretty good. Few years are needed to raise abundance to the highest point in the state. However, still fewer are needed to bring it into poverty for lack of commerce and manufacturing. Without speaking of its rise and fall of the uh, Venice Republic, Flanders and Barbent and the Dutch Republic, he lists off a bunch of cities here, places, who have succeeded each other in profitable branches of trade, one may say that France's power has only been on the rise from 1646 when factories were established to produce clothing which had previ previously been imported. In 1684, when the number of Protestants, entrepreneurs, and artisans were driven out of France, the kingdom has done nothing but recede since that last date, right? All their manufacturing had left. Here we go. I know no better measure than the leases and rents of property owners to judge the abundance and scarcity of money in circulation. When land is leased at a high rate, it is a sign that there is plenty of money in the state. But when land has been leased for much lower rates, it shows other things being equal that money is scarce. I have read in the state of France that acres of vineyards near Mantis, not far from the French capital, uh, which leased for 200 livres tournis, 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 <laughs> tournis? Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. A full weight in 1660 only leased for a hundred of the lighter money in the 1700s. However, the silver brought from the West Indies in the intervals should naturally have raised the price of the land in Europe. Um, so I'm going to leave it right there. But I think that is like probably one of the most important sections out of this entire book to really understand, right? That once you have dived into po dived into luxuries, it's only a matter of time before the poverty starts to kick in as the money is now leaving the state and moving towards foreign production. This is something that was described hundreds of years ago and there's no reason to believe that it's going to change now. If you think about it, like even the idea that manufacturing coming back to the United States can only only come back with subsidies or tariffs or you know doing some sort of trade war type of thing in order to keep the manufacturing here otherwise we would just buy the foreign production because it's far cheaper and the quality is starting to rise yes we do build quality stuff here in the United States but they're building quality stuff outside of the United States as well and it's literally only a matter of time before all the manufacturing leaves the United States if they were not to do some sort of tax funding or you know subsidies or something of that of that nature to bring it uh, bring it back okay so thank you so much for joining the stream we have 254 people watching right now with 52 likes i got a 20 dollars super chat from lavish patch kid thank you so much uh the law of civilization and decay by brooks adams is an important piece of the puzzle since you love this subject, it is basically about the history of money manipulation and how it affects societies. This should cover it. Well, that's a good, well, maybe we'll, I'll do my best, man. The law of civilization and decay. Yeah, I've heard of that one, but I don't think I've ever perused any of it. All right, let me cruise down here to the bottom. We'll kind of, I'm sorry if I skipped over, but we have a bunch of chats here going on. All right, interesting. Hey, y'all. Okay, money is supposed supposed to be abundant to meet each other's needs not to be spent on consumption well jesus i believe that is a very like i mean i think it's a great philosophy to think but i don't think that's any kind of real reality like money is money is not abundant like silver is not abundant even dollars themselves the federal reserve notes are not abundant right they're not meant to be abundant although that's kind of hard to say considering that you got all this money printing and a mass amounts of of debt and, and currency floating around the system but there is a limit to how many are actually out there and although they could produce more they are pulling them out and that right there is going to create situations in which that the people who are most needing that in order to pay their debts will start finding themselves in a nightmare situation see if you have like 
a very low standard of living, but a decent income that comes in, the fluctuation of money income, although can be painful, is not devastating. If you are strung out on debt, any fluctuation in money, especially going down, is going to be very devastating to you. And that's the unfortunate thing about having a limited amount of currency that's within the system is that we have an unlimited availability to debt. And if you had joined the, if you're a member of the channel, we had actually done a great video talking about the dollar funding stresses in China. Right here, this is a great read. I'm going to leave it right up there. You can check out the title for it. Go and check this one out. It shows how much demand for dollars exists outside of the United States. They're just talking about China, but they go into other places as well. If you, if you are of the belief that the dollar is on its way out and that nobody wants it, I would suggest paying the dollar to become a member of the channel and go and check out that video we did last Sunday. It will it will definitely uh, give you a different thought process on that. All right, cruising down here to the bottom. All right. Rich Deanna, is that a fact or is that propaganda? The nation has a lot of open land not being used. Where was that question from? Oh, I missed it. Well, let me go down here. How is... How is the answer, though? Seems like it's merely a speculative asset like any other. You guys are all chatting here. All right. Bitcoin is the answer if you like to be right. Well, Ricky versus the world. I mean, I think owning Bitcoin from a personal point of view, like, you know, individually, I think it's a great idea. In fact, I think silver is even a better idea. But, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I mean, I buy Bitcoin. I buy silver. But as far as being the answer, I don't think that's it. Like, I don't think Bitcoin is going to going to solve any problems. And in fact, if the world went to a Bitcoin standard, I think that that would actually be quite devastating for a lot of places, especially the United States. As we are not manufacturers of products, how are we supposed to get our, our Bitcoin, right? We wouldn't. We borrow money in order to buy other people's products, right? When we buy other people's products, we are sending dollars out there to the world. The world wants those dollars because there's such a demand for it due to the amount of debt that has been issued in dollars. This is, a, this is cyclical. Like this, this is the cycle in which that it goes. So we here in the United States produce a consumer. The debt issuance is like the gold mine. That's like the, the silver mine that Cantillon describes in his essay. Once that debt issuance comes to an end, we're falling into poverty. Like there's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. There is no way that the condition that we have put ourselves in for our standard of living can then go into productions and services to provide to the world in such a significant way that we can maintain this. This is the, the reason why we have elevated to the to the height that we are right now with our standard of living is due to the debt issuance that has been taking place over the last four decades and even more than that. I mean, if you really take it back all the way to the uh, to the creation of the Federal Reserve itself. But really, it was after the severing of the gold standard that really sent us into that fiat currency, 100 percent fiat currency. And there is really no reversing this without like some serious devastating pain and poverty. All right. Um, Bitcoin will be the hard gears in the economy. The store of value USD is likely the grease, the last stage of converting capital into physical goods and services. Uh, it, well, even on that, then you would still have to have some sort of limitation to, or at least see that's that. I mean, even on that, I don't think that's going to work. And the reason that I don't feel that is going to work is that if you take Gresham's law into consideration, that even if you had a Bitcoin backing, right, you can only issue out so much debt to 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 the limit of Bitcoin that you have, right? I mean, ultimately, if you have Bitcoin as a backing, then you would have to have like so many dollars to equal a certain amount of Bitcoin, right? And if this fluctuated, that would be a bad currency. People would just hoard onto the Bitcoin and therefore it wouldn't exist in the economy. Like literally it would be pulled out of the, think about it like this, okay? 
if you had two different currencies in 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 your hand and you're gonna see i'm a store right and i can use either one i'll take either one of them if you have gold and bitcoin and possibly your cell phone with bitcoin on it right you have gold in your bitcoin in one hand and cash in the other and you come to me and you're like hey which one of these do you want and i say ah i'll take whatever i don't care are you really gonna hand me gold or bitcoin when you can hand me cash i mean really Right, because the gold and Bitcoin will get hoarded away. No way will it get be used for a currency or a monetary process of anything out there if you have a fiat currency that's in the system. Because everybody would use the fiat currency and hoard the gold or Bitcoin. So, it, I mean, I don't even see it as being a backing to the currency unless the currency was fixed. Right, saying that we can't print any more because we only have so much Bitcoin and we have a fixed amount of dollars to that Bitcoin. In that sense, then okay, maybe, right? But it wouldn't be a fiat currency at that point. It would be a dollar-backed currency or a Bitcoin-backed currency or a gold-backed currency. Not the same. All right. The powers that be can break the internet at a moment of their choosing, then blockchain will be broken and forked. Well, charge them apart. I mean, that's... I mean, that's a hypothetical situation that is a possibility, but is that a guarantee? No. I mean, and is that, like, in my opinion, a, a high-level concern? It's not. You know? I mean, I would be more concerned about not being able to use my debit card if the internet went out than I would be about Bitcoin. Like, I would have more concern about my debit card in an internet outage than I would Bitcoin. Yeah. You know? Uh, because I can actually use my my debit card for things and I wouldn't be able to if the internet went out. All right. I also recommend for the stockholders to look up CUSIP number. If you don't hold physical certificates with the CUSIP number, how are you signing to prove ownership of the digital data that's lost? All right. Uh, yeah, I can see having massive sums of cash would be a problem. Look at Trump and everyone wants to get their hands on his money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> money. Does he really have any money or does he have debt? Uh, if the internet goes, I think we'll be having bigger troubles than the money. Yeah. Uh, it would break the whole economy. They won't do it. Let's cruise up here. Bitcoin backed currency wouldn't work. They would just issue Bitcoin 2 to expand the money supply, and it's basically fiat. I never heard of that one. Bitcoin 2 to expand the money. Yeah. All right. Pronounced Q SIP. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, how is the. How is the answer, though? Seems like a merely speculative asset like any other. We read that. I'm not sure which one we were talking about there. Did you know that Martin Luther King wrote his 95 thesis about indulgence? Indulgence that the Holy Roman Empire was diving into. Well, it's it's pretty... Like, once you understand... Once you understand, like... Once you understand how that flow of money starts, because you, you can just look at it for yourself, right? I mean, think about it. If you had like, you know, just some crappy minimum wage job and you were barely making, like you had an apartment and you say you had some crappy car and you know, you're, you're trying to make the payments. You can hardly, you know, you have to cut back on a lot of the things that you, you normally like would want to eat. You have to eat like lesser foods or just, you know, whatever. And this is the life that you lived, right? But all of a sudden you get a new job and it's paying double minimum wage. Right? Are you going to continue to live the same way? Like, you know, you're going to save all that money or invest that money, that new money that comes in. Or are you going to be like, finally, I can get rid of my crappy car and get a decent car. I'm going to start wearing nicer clothes. I'm going to enjoy this new money that's coming in. Everybody, that's human nature. There is no stopping that. That is going to take place, right? And so understanding that this human nature aspect of it, it doesn't really matter if you have politics involved or, you know, whatever kind of 
fiat money system that you have going on either. That None of that stuff really makes any difference to when it comes to human nature. People are going to conduct themselves in a particular fashion and usually, almost always, like I would imagine 99% of the people out there, if you get a little bit of new money coming in on a regular basis, you're going to want to enjoy that higher standard of living. That right there, that move, going from a lesser life into a higher standard of living is the move into luxuries. As much as we don't want to consider it a luxury, luxurious experience, but more of our hard work paying off, it doesn't matter how you look at it personally. It's the idea that you are actually buying newer stuff, getting higher quality things, and it's probably coming from foreign production. And there is no stopping that. Like if Cantillon can describe this from hundreds of years ago, and then talk about how the politicians really don't understand what is taking place at the time. And most likely they will make decisions that will allow people to continue to dive into luxuries. right? And then in the end, we'll end up suffering in the same misery and poverty as everybody else due to the fact that they just don't understand what it is that's happening at the time. As people are enjoying the money, they're like, hey, look how great everything is. Everybody's really happy and they got new stuff and they're all enjoying life. and. And everything's great, you know. I mean, nobody's nobody looks at that as a bad thing, right? I mean, why would you? You're like, man, I'm like enjoying my life, right? I'm enjoying the stuff. I'm enjoying the higher standard of living. This isn't bad. This is good. But ultimately, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing because what that's going to lead you into is suffering and poverty, especially when the new money turns off. So think about it again. If you were the minimum wage earner who all of a sudden doubled your doubled your income, you move into all these wonderful products that are out there, you raise your standard of living and then they come back to you and say, "Oh, sorry man, your job it's it's getting it's yeah, it's being shipped overseas. I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to manufacture these high quality things anymore and get paid a good price for it. You're going to have to go back to that minimum wage job that you had. Everything that you had, everything that you worked for, all the stuff gone, lost." right? You just end up having to sell it off, declare bankruptcy, whatever it is that's going on. But you're following back into the crappy car, the crappy apartment, the crappy clothes, right? Because that's all you can really afford. That's the fall back, you know, into, and I, it's not so bad if that's where you're at. It's horrible if that's where you fall back to, right? Once you have elevated yourself, it is a very heartbreaking, depressive, terrible experience right the nightmare of falling back into into poverty or the lack of luxuries you know okay it's pretty hard these days to get high quality stuff no it's not all right my it's you just got to pay for it you know my crazy family just told me they spent all their inheritance from my father you know, I I hear some of these stories sometimes about like people inheriting or coming into a great sum of money. And then, uh, you know, like they had some real good intentions with it at first. Like, you know, they might have bought a house or, you know, maybe even invested some of it. But then like literally within a matter of years, like in May, and sometimes it doesn't even take that long. It's gone. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I heard of, like, what was it? Over the course of three years, after acquiring like eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, although there was the purchase of a house, it wasn't paid for outright. It was just, you know, a lot of it was was put down on it. But ultimately, there's really nothing left, right? From from this from this cash and. Although, like I said, some of it might have been invested, some of it might have been saved. But to me, like, I'm thinking about that. It was just like, man, this huge chunk of cash came into your life three years ago, and it's essentially five years ago, six years ago, whatever it was. But it's essentially gone now. Like, you don't you don't have access to that much. You don't even have access to $100,000 anymore, you know, or without, like, cashing in a, a stock portfolio or something of that nature. And... Even on that, it wasn't, it's not nearly as much as the 800,000. So I thank my God. Like, what'd you do to your standard of living? You increased, like, it went up, right? Started hanging out and concerts and, you know, all the fun and all the things that came with it and nickel and dimed it all away, right? 
And this is like, I think this is probably a very typical thing that would happen, you know, just from human nature. It was just like, man, look at all this abundance of money I have. I'm going to enjoy it. Like, yeah, I'm going to spend it on something, you know, and not think about it and just say, hey, this is a good thing that I've always wanted in my life. And, and now I have it. Right. But not realizing how devastating that's going to be to you because of that dive into luxuries that you experienced. Once the money is gone, what do you have to do with it? You have to sell that thing off and you end up, you know, selling it off for half of what you paid for it or something of that nature. This is like common story that you hear over and over again. So it's like you can really understand the Cantillon effect just from your own personal view of like how you conduct yourself when you get new money coming in and moving into luxuries yourself. You look back, you're like, man, I wish I hadn't gone to that concert. I wish I hadn't spent all that money on that fancy steak dinners, you know, or something of that kind of nature. You know? All right, guys, I'm going to give it probably about another five, ten minutes and then I got to go. I find it funny AI is still new and everyone who invested in the stocks is flocking to it because the only thing making them money. I don't know. I'm making it. I did pretty well on Coinbase and that's, you know, I mean, I guess that's kind of techy. Yeah. All right. Uh, uneducated economist. This is from Sarge27271. Simon, howdy, bud. Whatever do whatever you do. Eyes wide open. Shit's getting crazy. Yeah, it sure is. It really is, too. People still expect to buy a $500 washing machine and have it last forever. Nope, you can still get the forever washer, but it will cost you way more. Yeah. Uh, if not for the Fed, a new car would cost $500. Well, yeah, it might cost $500 and nobody would have one. I mean... Just saying, right? I mean, only the most luxurious people, only the most, yeah, it, it, nobody would have one, right? I mean, it's just like, that's, and I shouldn't say that nobody would have one. What I should say is, is that if the Fed didn't exist and we were a manufacturing powerhouse and we didn't spend our money on luxuries, but instead took our money and reinvested it back into manufacturing or just invested it in general into any many directions that we could go but didn't use that money to increase our standard of living didn't use it to you know enjoy our lives right then yeah maybe you know you might be able to find a position in which that five hundred dollar cars could exist but nobody would really want one nobody would be buying them because that would be a luxury and everybody would be taking the bus right because this is the difference. Like, we here in America, we enjoy luxuries. Every, like, you know, I mean, the fact that I have three cars, right? Even though they're crappy cars, but I have three of them. They all run, right? That's a very luxurious thing, considering there's some people in this world who really live in poverty. And they will never have a chance to own a shitty car, right? Uh... Watch your video yesterday saying that we are experiencing the rates of 18 months ago now. So we are experiencing September 22, which was 3.8 to 3.2 percent. We have some ways to go. Yeah, and that's in. You also got to think this is like you know how far out that lag. Like that 18 month is not set in stone, right? That is like kind of the idea of what a lot of economists say out there is that once we are reaching the full impact of the rate move. However, that time lag may shorten up quite a bit when you have forward guidance being used, right? So like the Federal Reserve puts out some forward guidance like say two, three months ahead of time. Well, all of a sudden, the economy is reacting as if that rate cut has already taken place. So now that 18 month lag time might only be a year or, you know, or whatever. It's just like, it's hard to say how far out that lag is. What I do find interesting, though, is about the number that you just said there, that we're somewhere around three to three and a quarter percent. Really think about like how that Fed funds rate is impacting the economy today, you know, for that three and a quarter or whatever. And then also think about the neutral interest rate, the rate that is neither accommodating nor restricting the economy that has raised up as well. So now the neutral interest rate say is around 3%. The Fed funds rate is around 3%. Right now, is the economy in neutral? Right? I mean, are we going to be moving into restrictive times? 
is the neutral interest rate going to rise and the Fed stay still and actually slow or um, decrease the amount of restriction to the economy? It's still restrictive, but less restrictive as the neutral interest rate rises. See, so many questions are taking place out there, and now we don't really know exactly how that interest rate is impacting the neutral interest rate, considering that the Fed is keeping their stuff you know, in place, but the idea that it's going to be lowering into the future. Well, if we have inflation expectation that runs persistently high, the neutral interest rate will remain elevated, right? And actually drop below the Fed funds rate, or the, the Fed funds rate could drop below the neutral interest rate if that neutral interest rate was to remain elevated. This is so many questions to ask, right? I mean, these are all what ifs, right? Every single bit of it, but it's, it's stuff that you have to take into consideration, especially not knowing exactly where the neutral interest rate is in that lag time. To be to be honest yeah. all right guys what do we got here all right i got like four more minutes and then i gotta go all right inflation is ticking up even now yeah. i think we are about six months from an economic problem yeah i i kind of agree with that too and i think it's gonna have to do a lot with the liquidity issues like i think as the federal reserve is tightening up monetary policy they are going to create a situation in that the acquiring of dollars in order to pay off debt is going to become very difficult and the bankruptcies are going to rise even more and the defaults are going to take place. And you're going to find that the demand from the economy, the markets, the people, the governments even, will be saying the Fed should be printing money now. And they're going to be sitting there on their hands going, uh-uh, we're not going to. And the Treasury is prepared for that moment. They, they have already made the statements that they are going to be buying back their own bonds somewhere in the middle of 2024, right? This is all lining up. I mean, it's, it makes sense. They don't talk about that bond buyback much. You know, you really have to know that it exists, that the, the, even the idea of it exists. Because nowhere in anybody's strategy do they ever talk about it, right? I mean, you can go and Google it and see for yourself that it's, it's a real thing, a statement coming from the Treasury Department themselves. There was, you know, all the mainstream medias, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, everybody did articles on talking about the, the bond buyback and then went silent. Nobody talks about it anymore, right? Because if everybody knew that it was going to take place, then they would be concerning themselves for the liquidity crisis that is coming. And instead, they just don't even know that it's happening yet, except for those who are really paying attention. All right. All right, all nighter. As long as an econ problem is AFS after fishing season, so we can get a decent price for our fish. All right. Today I invested 250 in canned goods. Hey, that's a good idea, Luke. I mean, you know, to be honest, if you have never prepared for anything, canning supplies learn to can that is probably the number one thing once you learn to can have canning supplies know how that works then start going and collecting silver then move into other assets all uh, right great video thanks well thank you lucy i'm glad you guys are here we got 337 people watching with 115 likes i'm going to do this for another couple of minutes go hit the like button let's see if we can get it up to 200 likes before i end the video here in a couple of minutes all uh, right Ban TikTok should help Jerome reach his unemployment target. <laughs> what happened to lumber sales when the economy tanks a bit? Well, right now, I think lumber sales are pretty low, right? The mills are not eager to necessarily fill up the, the distribution network with all kinds of like loads of lumber inventory. It is pretty low, and I've actually had a few lumber vendors out there offer some pretty good deals like you know below what I would have anticipated the the market price to be so it's not a big it's not moving very fast and now this is something that I have talked about once the builder sentiment turns positive and although we have had the builder sentiment go positive on the last reading of it it's not 100% the buyer traffic portion is still incredibly negative right it's not buyer it's not buying conditions or sales conditions. It's the buyer traffic. That part right there is still very negative when it comes to the home builder sentiment. Once that part turns positive, man, lumber is going to be flying off the shelf. I, I'm, I, I mean, I can't, can't guarantee it, but that is like my belief that it is that it's on its way. 
And so we haven't seen the lumber prices move up quite, you know, as of yet, even though we're moving into the building season. Summertime is generally, you know, once you move into spring and then into summer, that's usually the building season as people want to frame the houses up during the good weather and then work on the inside of them during the, during the winter time. But right now, like the builder sentiment, although it's moving positive, it's still negative. So it hasn't created that situation in which that the demand for lumber is really going to start to ramp up. And I do see that coming. Like I could see that happening, especially if the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates, like actually lowers interest rates and not this all this credible threats about what it is that they are possibly going to be doing into the future, which is not an adjustment of interest rates. I don't care what anybody says. There is no promise to any rate cuts yet, right? The dot plot map is just an idea of where it is that these Fed officials believe that interest rates should be considering the current market conditions, but things always change. And by the time we get there, they're not gonna see it the same way anymore. So that's very important to understand that they have not locked in any kind of forward guidance or, or interest rate setting a policy at all. And as far as the monetary policy coming from the Federal Reserve, they are going for an average inflation rate over time, which is not a 2% target, but meaning that at some times they are going to have to allow inflation to run over the 2% target or under the 2% target in order to achieve that 2% average inflation rate over time, which means that 2% is no longer a target if they actually aim above it or below it. The aim is to go for an average inflation rate over time, which means that inflation expectation must remain elevated going into the future. That is very important to understand. Inflation expectation must remain elevated going into the future, regardless of where inflation is. The expectation must be there. And I think they have that. Right? I'm pretty sure the mainstream na media narrative and everything that's being spoken out there has everybody believing that inflation will be ramping back up or that it's here to stay. That is exactly what the Federal Reserve needed for their monetary policy. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you all for hitting that thumbs up button. Thank you very much for the $20 super chat. I really appreciate everybody who had joined in on this live stream. Go and hit that like button. And if you want your own copy of the Cantillon Estee, I left a link down in the description to for Amazon. Uh, it's an affiliate, so if you go and buy the essay, I get a little commission off of that, but you don't even have to buy the essay. The essay is for free at the Mises Institute, so just type in Cantillon Essay on Economic Theory, and you can go and download the PDF file for free, so you don't need to actually purchase this essay. But if you do purchase the essay, I do get a little commission off of that, and everything that you put in your cart for the next 24 hours, I will also get a little commission on that. So. Go and check that out for me, and thank you, everybody. Uneducated economists, you let me know.